um, hello, to, welcome back to my video diary, or welcome to it. Um, today, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a poem from this book. It's called Pierce Arrow. It's by Susan Howe. Um, a little bit of background, I guess, on Susan Howe. Um, so she is a, a poet who's um, been working... Um, I want to say since the 1960s, um, a very experimental poet. Um, she's known for um, looking at um, American intellectuals and poets. Um, her probably her most famous book is My Emily Dickinson, um, but her other books include uh, Depths and. Um, uh, probably should have looked it up beforehand. Oh well. Um, Susan Howe, you know, is the name, so you can look it up on your own. But uh, a lot of her um, poetry um, deals with figures from New England, um, figures from colonial America. Um, um, she has a book about the death, r related to the death of her husband, which um, takes um, from the work of Jonathan Edwards. Um, uh, uh, amongst others. She's also known for her, um, uh, what are they called, collage poems, where she kind of takes, um, she makes like these photocopies of like erasures and, um, uh, not erasures, but like f from different sources and arranges them in ways that are like really interesting to look at um, and to explore. And the first time that I encountered, encountered one of her collage poems, um, I was really blown away by it because it was a poem that I could read and I was, as I was reading the book, I was turning it, you know, and, and moving it to, so I could see the different words and words are cut off and you have to make guesses or, um, and especially as a way of looking at loss, um, not just the loss of someone, but the loss of knowledge or the loss of, um, you know, uh, artifacts, uh, manuscripts, she talks about in this lot, that, that's encountered a lot in her work, and I thought the collages are such an interesting um, way of looking at that kind of, those different kinds of losses. Um, so Pierce Arrow um, starts out with uh, prose sections, um, which talks about the life of um, Charles S. Pierce Purse, um, Pierce Purse, um, Pierce Arrow, and then um, Charles S. Purse, P-E-I-R-C-E, -E, and then P-I-E-R-C-E. -E. That's also something that Susan Howe does a lot, is playing with words, playing with the spelling, the pronunciation, um, the look um, of words, mixing them and, and, and moving them. And we'll see in this poet, poet, um, poem that I'm going to read here in a second, we'll see that evidently. Um, and then some other things, the, the, the poem has like little drawings, um, book has little drawings taken from the works of a uh, purse, um, diagrams, things like that. Um, other figures that are showcased in this book, um, there's a little bit about George um, Santayana, um, and then George Meredith shows up, um, his wife um, Mary Ellen, his first wife um, shows up a little bit, um, but she she um, famously, I guess maybe not so famously, I don't know, left him um, for, uh, maybe that was Mary Ellen that left him. Um, his first wife, yeah, I think Mary Ellen, his first wife, left him for a painter who um, painted George Meredith, who was the, the Death of Chatterton, a really famous poem that George Meredith uh, sat for. He was the, the figure of Chatterton. Um, then uh, Algernon Charles Swinburne um, and Theodore Watts Dunton um, show up also. Um, Algernon Charles Swinburne is, a, a, in my opinion, a really underrated poet from, from that time. Uh, all of these poets and, and writers, George Meredith, Peirce, um, 
Oh, and Persis' wife, Juliet, shows up too. And she's a mysterious figure, not just within the poem, but within actual real life. A lot of her history was um, erased purposely by, by herself and by Charles. Um, for whatever reason, um, there are a lot of theories, um, but uh, no, no real um, concrete facts. Um, so she shows up and is a very interesting figure. Um, both in reality, right, and in the poems themselves. Um, but all these writers and, and intellectuals are from the, you know, mid to late 1800s to the early 1900s, I think. Both Swinburne and um, George Meredith died in 1909, and then uh, Peirce died in 1913, 1914, something like that. Um, also, I think one thing that kind of unites all of them, George Meredith is still well-respected, um, but Swinburne and, and Peirce and Meredith, I would say, went through periods where their work really wasn't uh, considered. Um, Swinburne still, uh, not a lot of people go back and look at his work um, within poetry circles, at least with, within people that I brought it up to. Um, though when he was alive, you know, he's considered a, a, really, a really great poet. Um, and influential. George Meredith, uh, also a great poet and novelist. Um, Peirce was never, never appreciated in his lifetime and, and is now, probably just now within the last 50 years, being appreciated, um, especially for his, uh, for his contributions to mathematical logic um, and pragmatism, which he gave the name for, which William James uh, was one of his friends. So. William James is in this a little bit too. But uh, okay, so this is what the poems look like on the page. A lot of the poems are these, and then here's another manuscript. A lot of the poems are this short kind of block of text. Um, as you can see, very interesting to look at. Um, no uh, one thing that when I read this that you'll probably notice is that there is no punctuation. Um, there's really no sentences. Um, if anything, most of these poems are made up of uh, um, handfuls of phrases, right, which makes them kind of hard to follow. So if you um, can find a, a copy of Pierce Arrow and look at it, you know, I would advise you to, of course, read it. Um, and Susan Howe, I think, is one of the most, um, one of the greatest uh, American poets of, of our lifetime. Um, so you should read her work anyways. Um, and then her, what is it, her sister Susan Howe, no, Marie, <laughs> Susan Howe, um, her sister, uh, oh, what's her sister's name? I can't remember. Uh, she's also a great poet. And then there's, was it Marie Howe? There's so, there are several Howes. Um, only two of them are related. Um, so they're all great poets. You should read all of their work. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is from Pierce Arrow, and I'm going to kind of read this, and then we'll kind of unpack it a little bit. But I just want to kind of get it out there, because I think this is a great little poem. It's hard to say if this is a poem or part of a larger poem, but I'm going to call it an individual one. And I think it's really interesting. So, silver age, shaken authority, fevered ages quickly arrive, and the royal and the old royal family so familiar to me that I seem in reading to live the Iron Age over am civil stranger um, or am civil stranger foreign republic neither to be going to be nor to be going not to be a future determinately no no the golden age of poetry um, and if you had trouble following that that's okay uh, it's a hard poem to follow um, I had to read it several times and I think just now reading it aloud um, really kind of helped me um, unpack it even more um, silver age shaken authority so we start in this um, kind of place where where it's not the golden age right it's it's the one right below that's the silver age um, a shaken authority where things are starting to to to, to the the poets or the writers or um, if we're talking about the 1800s even the 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 um, empires and things like that are starting to shake right um, lots of revolutions during the the 1800s and of course going into the 1900s the empires would would eventually be totally 
totally toppled. Not really, right? Because we still have an American empire and stuff like that nowadays. But you, you know what I mean. The surface of it, I guess. Um, fevered ages quickly arrive, right? Fevered ages. These, these uh, sick kind of states. But also a fevered kind of passionate, right? Um, the, the word works both ways. In the old royal family, so familiar to me that I seem in reading to live the Iron Age over am civil stranger foreign republic so here's where it gets a little kind of uh, uh, mushed up but i think what it's trying to do um and i'm not going to totally explicate everything in this poem but i think what this point is trying to do is the way that these things are kind of crashing together um all at once this iron age this silver age this royal family this uh civil stranger foreign republic um all of these things kind of coming together and clashing a time of revolution and these times are confusing and a time of change these times are confusing and a time where the past and the present and the future kind of come together um where what is familiar becomes unfamiliar and what is unfamiliar becomes familiar um neither to be going to be nor to be going not to be and of course um here we have the to be um, not to be right f from Shakespeare and so we have even more um, Shakespeare thrown into this kind of confusing confusing um, moment right Shakespeare but not Shakespeare right familiar but unfamiliar right um, neither to be going to be nor to be going not to be right to be going right to be going to be um, nor to be going not to be these these futures that are coming and going that are perhaps to be or to not to be right and and then ultimately right um we kind of think in our heads well um if you're familiar with shakespeare like it goes to be or not to be that is the question you know whether it is nobler right and 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 it's a contemplation of suicide here but here it's not an individual suicide right it's perhaps um the end of these times right um and that whole to be or not to be is kind of uh, that whole dialogue or monologue, right? Um, uh, I guess it's a soliloquy um, since it's Shakespeare, but um, a play. But uh, this moment um, is a dream, right? And we're caught in this kind of dreamlike state, not just of, of clashing ages and clashing familiar and unfamiliar, but also the language itself is steeped in this kind of confusion, in this kind of dreamlike um, what is life and what is not life, what is poetry and what is not poetry, what is government and what is not government, right? Um, and then so we get to be to be going, not to be a future determinately a future determinately no no the golden age of poetry a future determinately no right so to be or not to be right this is the question right um but this future is not determined right this this future is not something that we can just rely on right and the future never is um i think especially in this time we kind of resonate with that fact um no the golden age of poetry the golden age of poetry then is caught up in all this meeting of the familiar and unfamiliar right this change this constant state of flux right and that's where poetry lies right real golden poetry in 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 how's poem right um and also this state of change within language, right? Um, the language that we're used to being put into new contexts or used in new ways or um, the, the, the avant-garde meeting with the um, establishment, right? And these things kind of clashing together. And this kind of clash is what's, what creates this golden age of poetry, right? And so perhaps part of what how is saying and like i said i'm not going to ex explicate this poem i think it's a very um short but dense poem but one thing i think that how is perhaps saying in this poem is that um the golden age of poetry can never really be one of peace right and that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to come out of war though a lot of great poetry has come out of war i think what it means is that um the struggle with language right the struggle with 
questions like to be or not to be, the struggle with the past and with influence, right? All of those things need to contribute for poetry to be um, as good as it can be, right? The struggle must be there, right? Whether you're writing about love or um, happiness or joy or sorrow and strife and, and death, right? Um, that struggle still needs to be there. There needs to be some kind of struggle um, to have the language achieve what it's meant to achieve, right? To have the language be something beyond just words on a page, right? And that's always going to come down to a struggle. That's never going to be the, the, the easy, right? The easy way out is never going to produce the golden age of poetry. Um, and I think that's part of what Susan Howe is looking at in this sh shorter shorter poem and it comes within the context of the greater book right and I think that idea fits within the context of the struggles of people like Swinburne and people like Purse and people like Juliet Purse's wife right um, and Mary Ellen uh, George Meredith's Meredith's wife right and Susan Howe has um, always been a, a, a poet who who's seeking to look for those people that have typically been ignored um, and I think that this poem is kind of illustrating that also. Um, okay, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Uh,